Something else that you also find is this bark staining. So this is coast live oak. This is California black oak. You can see the staining occurs at the root collar. It can go up to the larger branches, and it's very characteristic. And it can also be very diagnostic. It can appear these kind of dark black, red, wet staining. It can also appear like a bleeding, which you may think of with sudden oak death that occurs in more northern California. But there's also something very impressive about it. And cross your fingers. All right, we're good. So this is a coast live oak. This is a small, what I'd say a smaller staining spot. Watch the bottom of the cut area. So right here, did you see that? All right, keep watching. More of it. So you'll see water come pouring out of this tree. There's more. Not typical of drought stressed trees. So what I think is going on here, you get a lot of this injury under the bark and the bark separates from the wood is a wound response it starts to collect with water and you see this kind of seeping out of the tree here. I think there's a little bit more. Yeah, so there's more. So pretty impressive. This is another picture showing that. So Coast Live Oak where you cut into it and you can see the water pooling on the dirt. Something else, and we saw this from the pictures, is a lot of this crown thinning and dieback. And you'll get all these symptoms across the entire ranges. You'll see them on trees that have full canopies or ones that are like this. And this is something you can really key in on because when coast live oak is healthy, it has this really deep, dark, lustrous green color. And it starts to take on that gray appearance from those earlier pictures I saw, I showed you. This is California black oak midsummer. You can see very extensive thinning in the canopy. Now early on, one of my old bosses told me that it really doesn't take much money to do forest entomology. You can basically do it very cheap. You just need one tool, and that is an ax. I call mine the problem solver. And yes, apparently what a lot of people didn't do early on was really dig into these trees. If I want to know what's going on, I go right to the source. So here you go. Coast Live Oak, there's a the problem solver. You'll see this here, all this larva injury, very extensive right on the surface of the sapwood, right under the bark. Here it is again. You remember that tree I showed you with all the exit holes? Same tree. With the toothpicks, that was right here and here. So again, and there's a lot going on in this picture. All this larva feeding under the bark, pretty extensive. This is very high density larva feeding. It caused a patch kill. Now you'll see this one little square right here. This is this callus tissue. The trees are healthy enough, they realize something's wrong. They're trying to fight off this injury. So this is cow's tissue. This also right here is cow's tissue. It's trying to wall off that patch killed area. And you'll see it more again here, this little white line in the bark. So they are trying to fight it off. And it does take several years for these trees to, to die. And I think that's one of the main problems. This is California black oak, same kind of look. Now, so with these larva galleries, you may think of bark beetles having a very specific pattern. They don't really have that. They just kind of do this general meandering around all over the place. They will do these kind of very concentrated patches of feeding, but right in the cambium, right at the surface of the wood and the phloem where it's moving water and moving nutrients, where it exactly really doesn't need to be feeding. And just to show you the densities of how high it is, so this is a piece of coast live oak. All this is larva feeding. And again, another piece, this is a cross section of coast live oak. Coast live oak has very thick bark, so here's the wood. All this black line is larva galleries, and then they feed here and then move to the outer bark to pupae. And this is just to show you again how the trees fight it off, but it really doesn't slow the beetle down much at all. So here's larva feeding this black line. This other white line is callus tissue, and then again you'll see more of black of the larva feeding. And you'll see several times when it'll produce callus tissue after callus tissue. Well, of course, now we know it's not drought. It is the gold-spotted oak borer, as I call it, G-sob, Agralis coxalis. This is a female. This is a male. They do have these very characteristic orange spots which really make them easy to identify. And you can see they are very small. They're about a centimeter in length. The larva, your typical buprested larva, here's one moving in the outer bark. <coughs> when mature, they're about two centimeters, but they do have these very characteristic uh, pincher-like spines known to the agrilis, and they also have C-shaped spiracles. <clears throat> right now, if you go out into the woods, this is what you're going to see. So they're kind of waiting for the warm weather. They're mature larvae in this pre-pupil behavior, so they fold over on themselves. This is the bark exterior. This makes it really easy to go out and sample infested trees and also get populations. 
Here's the pupa, pupates in the outer bark. One thing we haven't seen is larva. We've never, or larva eggs, we've never seen eggs. I've tried to really hard to find them last year, even get them in the lab, I've never seen them. So in Southern California, we have four primary oak species. Coast live oak, California black oak, this is canyon live oak, and Engelman oak. G. Saab attacks and kills all these but Engelman. So these two are red oak species, it loves these. This is an intermediate oak species, it's not a red, it's not a white. So G. Saab will attack and kill it, but it doesn't seem to prefer it. And Engelman here, it's a white oak species. So we think there's some kind of susceptibility there with primarily bark thickness, phloem thickness, and kind of structure. Red oaks have much more of a spongy phloem. White oaks have much more of a kind of a fibrous, thin phloem. G. Saab prior to 2008. Well, there was really no G. Saab. I gave it that name. So what did we know about it? That's about it. I mean, really, we had nothing to go on. When I found this in 08, there wasn't a whole huge selection of literature I could turn to and say, how do we manage this problem? But this is basically all we had, just previous collection records. And there was about a little bit less than 60 that we knew about. So where is it from? It was first described here in southern Mexico. There have been several collections in Chiapas and Guatemala. This was described as a Gryllus coxalis in the late 1800s. Southeastern Arizona, this was a, described as a second species, Agrilis argutatus, in the early 1900s. So ever since our, well, eventually they synonymized the two, so they're both Agrilis coxalis. But ever since our new problem popped up in California, the taxonomist went back and said, all right, well, there are minor morphological differences between these two groups. We'll give them subspecies. So this is argutatus, and this is coxalis. All right, well, where is our California population from? The taxonomists think it's from Arizona. They possess these same minor morphological differences that the Mexican populations don't have. And what they're basing this on is the size and the color of the spots on elytra and also this little ridge on the prothorax there. <coughs> so when I show you that map saying it's from Arizona, it's from Mexico, some of y'all might say, well, that's a range expansion. And I'm going to say, no, it's not. <coughs> I do believe GSOB was introduced. Um, the earliest records we can find G. Saab in California is 2004, and this was picked up in a California Department of Food and Ag exotic wood boring survey. We've gone through all the literature, we've gone through all the, a lot of the museum collections, we've never found it before 04. When you start looking at this initial mortality, it's located in two recreation areas. So what do people do in these recreation areas? They camp. What do a lot of people do when they camp? They bring firewood. So if you know anything about a gryllus, it loves firewood. So guess what? Yes, g -Sob can survive in firewood. We figured this out. So I think it was probably brought in from the native regions on firewood, and if I had to guess, about 10 or 15 years ago. So when you start looking at the pattern of mortality and infestation, if you remember that 0209 mortality map I showed you, it was really concentrated in one area, and it is expanding out. So we're not seeing this mortality move in from the east, from Arizona, or from the south. It does look like a spot introduction that is expanding out from these areas, and we have plot data that shows this. But here's the kicker. We do have this great geographical barrier between California, Arizona, and New Mexico. So here we are. This is where all the mortality is going on in San Diego County, this green color, the oak woodlands, which go a little bit in the Baja. Here's a lot of these previous collection sites around Tucson and then more oak woodlands. So if something is going to expand its range from this region, it's got to cross this big, nasty mustard color here. So that <coughs> is the Sonoran Desert. And if it is going to cross that, it's got to go through areas that, of this lush oak woodland that look like this. Hold on, there's more. More oak woodland and more oak woodland. So no, I don't buy a range expansion. It's about 550 kilometers from San Diego to the Tucson area, which is the closest it could probably expand its range from. And I don't really believe that. But there is something that does cross this area. Anybody got any guesses? about Interstate 8. Runs pretty much right from the Tucson area, bisects right through the Cleveland, right where the mortality, where I believe the infestation ex started. So it could be our potential pathway of introduction. <clears throat> so why is GSAB a concern? Well, as kind of as I already said, we knew nothing about this prior to 2008. I couldn't tell the National Force, here's your problem, here's how you manage it, manage the problem. But this is also, a big problem. I do believe it is exotic to California. 
It is feeding on new hosts. It's behaving like an exotic. All these densities and populations that are going on, this mortality has been continuous. It's not building up and dropping off like you would think of a native problem. It's just continuous, and we continue to map it in new areas, and we continue to map more mortality. So early on, st st people still keep coming back to this. Well, drought is driving it, and I don't really believe that either. And I'll talk more about this, but I do believe GSOB is aggressive for the reasons where you see mortality. I'll see mortality out on a landscape like this, but also in somebody's front yard. Their tree that's getting water, that's getting fertilizer, that's getting as much love and care as it can, and it's still succumbing to GSOB herbivory. But besides just killing trees, yes, you've got to think about the other problems. It is threatening wildlife habitat and food sources. It's changing the fuel structure in an area that's very prone to wildfire. This is a big concern for the national forest. And then also, you start to get a lot of these dead trees around houses and roadways. So it becomes a safety concern. The National Forest doesn't want you to come into their campground and have a tree fall on you. They're very concerned about that. Safety is a main priority. <clears throat> well, what do we know? Well, what do we know about other agrilis species? How about agrilis planipinus emerald ash borer? So yes, this is another big problem for forest health. It kills every ash tree. It basically comes in contact in the northeast. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of research going to it. So we know a lot about this. So basically, what I've used EAB for is my little cookbook. Say, OK, what have they done? What works for emerald ash borer? Let's use it for GSOB in California. And that's kind of where we're at. <clears throat> so because we do know nothing about this, we're doing even the basic biology work, trying to figure out what life stage is where at what time of year. We're also looking at its distribution in California. We're enhancing, trying to enhance survey and trapping techniques, monitoring tree health and decline, really trying to tease out that drought question. I think it came in on firewood. All right, how do we manage firewood? We're doing insecticide trials to prevent some of the tree mortality of these high value trees. We're also looking at its impact in the forest. How bad is this going to look in a few years? And then really, the long-term management solution, developing a biological control program. So these are EAB traps. Um, they found out it's very visual. Early on, I did some testing to look at these traps versus other kind of bark beetle traps. These work much better. So GSOB apparently is also visual, visual too. It loves this purple and green color. But something else that we're also doing is linking this with ground surveys. So if somebody said they saw an oak tree die in Southern California, I went and looked at it to really kind of figure out what the range is of this new pest. And with that, we had other, we had 70 different trapping sites throughout all of California. So yes, most of them were concentrated in Southern California, but they ran up the coast and then up the Sierra. So all the yellow dots here, these are negative trap catches. All the red ones are positive trap catches it is still isolated to San Diego County. We do have this one kind of population you'll see out by the coast in La Jolla, which does appear to be a satellite infestation. It doesn't seem continuous with the regular zone. So how did it get there? My guess is firewood, people moving firewood from the national forest or private land into the communities. So here's Seibold. Again, following suit with EAB, they found that these traps work better at different heights. So that's what we're looking at, hanging these traps at 4, 3, and 1.5 meters. We did this with the green as well. We did it at two elevations. We had several sites at each elevation with the purple and green trap. So this is some of our preliminary data. They didn't put any stats up here because none of it's significant. But here's your lime green, here's your purple, the different heights, mean GSOB trap catch. So like EAB, green works better in the canopy. They found if you put green up equal with the canopy or mid canopy, you get pretty good trap catch. With the purple, it works better lower in the canopy, under the crown. And that's kind of what we found with GSOB. So we are kind of using these heights now as our standard trapping. Although maybe they're not really significant, we are getting more trap catches. Something else we were also able to pull out of this data is when it's actually flying. So we started trapping in mid-January, not knowing when this was going to pop out. But we didn't see it at both of our elevations till about late May or the 1st of June. But they both seemed to peak by early July. This was in 09, 08 they peaked to late June, so pretty comparable. 
and then it dropped down to about early September. But you can catch beetles all the way up till November. It's just really sporadic and really low densities. And if you'll see here, you'll, the mean GSOB catch is pretty low for these. And that's one of our other problems. <clears throat> so we are trying to enhance our trap catch by using some of these lures that they have developed for EAB. So what they found EAB is attracted to is this Z3 hexanol. These are their two kind of main components, this Phoebe oil and Manuka oil. Also ethanol, just your regular um, tree stress volatile. And then our simple just baited purple or green trap. We had three sites set up with this with all these treatments and we randomized them weekly. Again, some of our initial data, but none of this was significant either. So here's our green, our purple, Z3, Phoebe, Manuka, Control, and then our ethanol. So no, really, no difference between the treatments and our unbaited control, and really the same here. And this is a little bit skewed, it's a little bit higher, but nothing's really jumping out at me saying, oh, we have something that's potentially a volatile that can help us with our trap catch, which is one reason we've moved this direction. So here's Damon Crook. What we've done is assess oak volatiles from uninfested trees. So this is coast live oak, and what we did is girdle them. And we come back and girdle them again, but above our initial girdle to really sample the bark after it's been stressed. And we did this for coast live oak and then also a non-host for Engelman oak to see if we could potentially shut down a trap catch at some point. Sampled our bark, these are aerate them for 24 hours, take these samples, send them off to Damon. And this is some of his initial work. So this is coast live oak, uninfested, fresh bark. And here's the peaks. So these are monoterpenes, these are sesquiterpenes. This is mostly what they use for EAB to trap. And you'll see very low with day one. Now come day three, after it's been stressed a little bit, well, we did see this huge rise in these monoterpenes. Still mo not much with the sesquiterpenes. So what we're going to do is really identify these peaks, do the EAD analysis with GSOB, find something that it responds to, and then we'll field test some of these compounds next year. Um, Damon's also going to do the retinal gram analysis to see if we need to tweak that purple and lime green color more for GSOB um, away from what they're using for EAB. So tree health and decline. This is one big question I have, and it's one question that everybody really wants to know is, does every tree that get infested, does it die? And how long does it take for those trees to die? So what I've done is developed this health rating system using those GSOB symptoms that I've talked about. And basically what we're doing is just tagging trees across this whole health range and seeing when they die and how long it takes. But also we're using this system really tease out how much drought is potentially playing a role in this mortality. So here's the health rating system. It incorporates some of the crown thinning and dieback. So everything from healthy full crown to dead. Also, the bark staining, is it present? And, you know, can we find less than five? Is the injury so extensive that bark's starting to crack off? Also, exit holes, can we find an exit hole? Just one, two, is it kind of that hammered again? Can we find more than 25 along the lower part of the bowl? And then again, just woodpecker foraging. Sometimes this is all you'll see to let you know that the tree's infested. So here it is, we have tagged trees across this whole health range. I think we're up to about 200 now, and we just sit and play the waiting game. And I hate to say it, but I hope they all die. And we'll figure out where, what, what stage these trees do die and how long it takes. But kind of instead of waiting for that point, something else I also want to know is, what's the threshold needed to kill a tree? How many GSOBs emerge from a tree before it dies? So this is Coast Live Oak, here's a lot of the staining. What I've done is subsample parts of the main stem at the cardinal directions and count all the exit holes to try to get that threshold. So on average, we've already done about 50 trees. We're pushing about, you know, a little over 40, about 47 exit holes per tree in these sampled areas. But what I'd really like to do is get a strong regression so a land manager can go up to a tree and say, okay, this tree is potentially going to die within a year. Rather than be a hazard, we're going to cut it. So here's this best fitted line. Here's all my data points across DBH. It's a very loose uh, fit, but this is some of our just initial data, and we'll, we'll get more for this. But 
hopefully in the long run, it can be a tool for a land manager to define when a tree is going to die. So as far as the interaction with drought, again, looking at healthy, kind of light, moderate, and severely injured trees across this whole range um, of health, con health conditions. So what we're doing is, so here's our infested area, looking in and out of the infested zone. So we have uninfested sites up on the Palomar District, another one right at the Mexican border, and then our two infested areas within the zone of mortality. And this is the work with Nancy Grokey. And what she's measuring is looking at a whole slew of tree health measurements. And what I really wanted her to do was link my morphological data with her physiological data. Give me something that I can rely on for my health measurements. Give me some physiological meeting to them. So she is measuring water potential, leaf turgor pressure. This is a pressure bomb for water potential. She's also measuring the photosynthetic rate. She's taking soil moisture. And she's also sampling the leaf tissue um, to look at what's going on there. So some of our early data, she started this last year. This is a measure of water use efficiency. This is the tree's ability to allocate carbon and control water loss. So the more positive, the more effective or efficient it is at doing this. So the more negative, the tree's got problems. So Campo, this is one of our uninfested sites. It's actually now infested. But this shows early season in blue, late summer in red for young, mature, old trees. GSOB loves old trees. It keys on those first and then works down to the smaller size classes. So early on, the blue in the summer, all the size classes are healthy. There's not really significant drought stress that everybody claims is going on in these areas. But what we see across our four sites, they're highly variable. They're very variable. But late summer, young trees are still doing pretty well. We do see a drop in these mature old trees. Now Campo was our driest site. So what she believes, by the time GSOB moves into this area, it'll probably do that much better because these trees are potentially a little bit stressed. But we'll keep following these next year to see if they do rebound again early summer after the winter rainfall. Well, what about our, one of our infested sites? So here's Cottonwood. This is clean, uninfested, light, moderate, heavy or severely injured from GSOB. Again, early summer, late summer, and this is water use efficiency again. So the more positive, the better. Clean and uninfested trees, they're not really stressed out. They're doing good. But when you start adding GSOB injury into it, we do see this decline. So lightly injured, moderately injured, and then heavy, severely injured. So what this also is a great picture just showing how GSOB is killing a tree. But it also kind of validates my health rating system again, saying, all right, I'm not just calling something what it's not, but we'll keep teasing this out and again, following these trees as they die at a site. Firewood. So it's how I think it came into California. If you really want to get on my good side, say, all right, Tom, start collecting as much firewood as you can, multiple species, multiple sites, grab it, move it three or four times, and then we've got a study. So this is a pain, really, to collect this much wood. But it's something we need to do, because this is a big concern. And we are concerned about this moving off of the national forest. So what we're really looking at is solarization treatments. How can we sanitize infested firewood? And we are looking at three treatments. We basically have our shaded control. We want to see emergence out of this. And then we have a direct sunlight. OK, it's pretty hot in Southern California. Can we just bake it with the sun? Is that going to be enough? And then we also have this tarp treatment, kind of a greenhouse effect. Let's get it really hot in there. Let's see if we can sanitize the wood. We sampled them every week. We had, again, two, two sites. We did Coast Live Oak. We did California Black Oak. Multiple reps at each site. Broke them down at the end of the year. Did it work? No, it didn't work. Again, none of this is significant. Here's our controls, direct sunlight, tarp treatments. Basically, the solarization treatments just made them develop faster. They popped out a little bit earlier, about a week or so. But no really difference. But our treatments really did do what we wanted them to do. We did get higher temperatures in our tarp treatments, a little bit higher in the direct sunlight. When you look at the max temperature for our two solarizations, we really did bump it up there in really good high temperatures throughout midsummer, but it really wasn't enough. I mean, bark is a great insulator. GSOB's not feeding at this point. It's in mature larva. It's just waiting for that warm weather, and apparently it's not enough to kill the beetle. 
So yes, we're doing more firewood studies. Kind of modifying this a little bit, but we're taking the wood from here to there. So chipping studies. This is what they found works really well for EAB. All right, let's see how well it does for GSOB. So I did this last fall, got me a big coast live oak, cut it down, threw it into a chipper. This is a tub grinder. This can handle about 10 foot size logs. Put it in there in about two seconds, you get this nice big pile. So collect all this. And this is really a lot of these cogent plants in the area, they want this material. This is a great fuel source for making energy. Oaks burns real hot. So this is what they want. They want what they call a four minus chip. So that's what I'm testing, because that's pretty much what they're going to use it as. So again, take it, bagged it up. Here's our controls. We've already got those bagged up. And again, we're playing the waiting game. So hopefully come May, I'd be surprised if we do see emergence out of this, but there might be some, and I will expect it there. But one question I don't know from this, but I'd really like to know is how much does the actual act of chipping damage the beetle, or is it the heat? So what we did is made little models. So here's GSOB, here's our little models, painted them orange. We made 100 of these, had four logs, put 25 in a log, sealed them up, put them in the bark where they would be at this time of year, into the chipper. So what did we get out of it? We put in 100, we found six. So of the six, four of them were damaged though. So that's a start. So they're all in the piles, and I didn't want to go in to disturb the piles right now because there may be populations in there, but we'll go back and hopefully find more. It's not going to be easy, but it's a start. So to really protect those high-value trees, we are looking at insecticides. And for EAB, this is their kind of silver bullet, imomectin benzoate. And we're looking at it as a stem injection. We're also doing omitted cloprid as a soil injection and then emitted cloprid as a stem injection too. We started this work last year, and I'm just gonna to touch on it for time, but these stem injections, well, you can do one tree, leave, come back the next day, and it's still not done yet. This takes a long time, it's not that easy. I don't see if anybody's really gonna treat trees, this is the way they're gonna go, just because of how variable it is. So what we are doing this year is doing another method. What they have is this kind of pressurized gun. So instead of doing the passive uh, injections where the tree uptakes it, you're really forcing it into the tree with this gun. So this is something else we're looking at. You can treat a tree in 20 minutes. This, is, this makes more sense to me. But something else we're also looking at is really treatment timing. You know, with the rains in Southern California, is it best to treat in the winter? Is it best to treat in the spring? We know how quickly it can get uptake into the foliage, and we'll sample foliage three times throughout the year. And we'll also do feeding assays this year to see how, if it's really impacting the beetle itself, but we're really trying to tease that out. Which method works best? When's the best time to treat? And what's the duration of the treatment? <coughs> and all that's undergoing. So because of our kind of unique problem where we have this what we like to call an indigenous exotic, something from within the U.S. or from the continent that's causing problem pretty much in the same areas. So we're doing foreign exploration. We're going back across Interstate 8, looking at these native areas to see what it's doing in Arizona. So this is all on the Coronado National Forest. These are all the previous uh, collections. This is the Santa Rita Mountains. This is the Oak Juniper Woodlands. Not any really significant oak mortality going on in these areas. What about the Chiricahuas? This is in the National Monument. There's not problems going on here either. Everything's just fine. Huachucas, same thing. This is all oak woodlands, no problems. Um, so what's one thing different about Arizona? Well, they have different oak species. So in California, it is new host associations. This is silverleaf oak, emery oak, Arizona white, gray oak. These two are white oaks, these two are red oaks. Anybody guess which one GSOB attacks? The two red oak species. So again, we think there's this difference between bark thickness, phloem thickness, um, between the red and white oak species. So again, we never knew this either. This is all new from 08. But again, that big question, 
Okay, we kind of have an idea of what GSOB is doing here. What is it doing in Arizona? So we've started setting up these long-term plots taking forest stand data. This is up on Mount Laguna. This is dead California black oak. Figuring out what's the stand composition, how many trees per hectare, what's the basal layer, what's GSOB doing uh, infestation rates wise, what's the mortality? And so here's a little bit of that data. So California's in red, Arizona's blue. So total and oak basal layer. Just let's look at the red right now. So oaks make up a large component of these stands. And coast live oak, that's all it is. It's all coast live oak. You start getting California black oak mixed with Jeffrey pine at higher elevations. How many trees per hectare? All right, so still a lot of oak trees. But what this is saying is out on the landscape, we have big oak trees, very mature, old, fairly even aged oak trees. All right, well, how's that compare to Arizona? Well, they have much less basal area. Oaks still make up a large component of these stands, but look how many trees per hectare, way up there. There's a lot of variability here, but, so instead of having trees like this, they have trees like this. So very different stand conditions, much higher stand, con stand densities, much younger trees in these areas. All right, well, what's the important piece? What's GSOB doing? When you start looking at the infestation rate on average across the national forest, uh, across the Descanso Ranger District, it's 65%. In some areas, it's almost up to 100 for every mature tree. In other areas, it's down to 14%. Remember, it is expanding out of these areas. But what about Arizona? Less than 1%. It's hard to find this. I think we found about 10 trees across four mountain ranges that have GSOB in them. Okay, we start looking at the dead trees on the landscape. Well, in Arizona, they actually have a little bit more, but I think this is just an artifact of how many trees are out there on the landscape. In California, right now, on average, across the district, it's 12% mortality. Again, some areas, it's pushing 50%. But when you start looking at these dead trees, how many of them show signs of GSOB injury? I can't say that GSOB officially killed all these, but how many of them show signs? California? We're over 90%. Basically, the only tree that doesn't show signs of injury are the trees that died 10 years ago that are still standing. Arizona, we're back less than 1% again. It's not on every dead tree. It's only associated with some of these trees on the landscape. It's behaving as a native should. Very late and low levels attacking trees here and there. <clears throat> so this is also putting my health rating system to use. What is the health conditions of the trees in our plots in California. So healthy, this is about a quarter of the stand, but remember that about 65% or 65 of these are all infested. So some of these might be infested. All right, about another quarter, quarter of them are showing minor thinning and twig dieback. Some of these are infested as well. The moderate thinning, about another quarter. Most of these are all infested, pretty much every one of them. And the same is true so for the severe thinning and dieback and then the rest are dead standing oak trees. So what this tells me is that, yes, this mortality is going to continue. These are all going to keep cycling this way. But right now, I expect probably most of these to die within the next couple of years. And then those will move there. Back to Arizona. So this is what we're looking for. We want trees that died within the past year that potentially have active populations. So this is what I key in on. I see red. So this is Emory Oak, this is on the Chiricahuas. Notice everything else around it is pretty good. This is another Emory Oak, this is on the Huchas. This may be California's saver. This tree uh, has tons of GSOB populations and other things. So here, this is up on Santa Catalina's. Here's Mark, he loves this picture, not because he's in it, but because of this. There's a foot of snow on the ground. This is up about 6,000 feet. This beetle can withstand some cold temperature. It's already up about 6,000 feet on the Cleveland. So I do think this can move north. Here's this another dead emery oak right here. This is on the Santa Rita's. This is the initial one I found in 08. Here's some of our trapping. Here's Seibold again. This is what we're looking for, again. This is in the fall, winter time. This is what I want to find. So here's that same emery oak from 08. You see it has a little bit of staining. Same symptoms that we see in California we see here. So again, I put the problem solver to use. We go from here to here.
Remember, it pupates in the outer bark, mature larva in the outer bark. So that's all I took. I just took the outer bark. What did I find? Yes, I found GSOB. This verifies the host. We didn't know that. I got about 100 out of this, the bark. This is the only wood bore I found. What else did I find? Uh-oh. So here's GSOB larva. What is this? Parasitoids. All right. This is from our most recent trip about a month ago. This is another emery oak. This is pupa, I believe, of that same parasitoid. So which one is this? This is a Calisota species. It's a Eupelmid. Anybody know it? Probably not. It's never been described. Nobody has ever seen this. We don't know anything about it. So I'm just throwing it out there that Calisota culmini has a good ring to it. But we'll see. So Gary Gibson has this, and he's going to describe it for us. <clears throat> Basically, what we know about eupelmids, they are parasitoids of gall makers and wood borers. What do we also get out of this trio? I got a Bricana, the Tinnacola simplex. This kind of has more of an ag a widespread distribution throughout the U.S. We know it attacks buprestids, cerambicids, two-line chestnut borer, another agrilis. I think it's been associated with EAB. It's also been associated with oak cordwood borer, which we find in California. But I've never seen it pop out of GSOB infested logs or seen it on GSOB larvae. Something else I also got from this bark, I got some bark gnaw gnawing beetles, tragocytids. And so with that, just with this initial survey, we have quite a nice little natural enemy complex going here. Some more tragocytids. I believe this is an elaterid. Pull these out of GSOB galleries. So this is really good for Arizona. Maybe one reason they're not seeing problems, maybe it's also combined with the host resistance. What do we got going on in California? Poor little guys all alone. So a snake fly larva, a generalist predator. I've only seen this once. Something's just opportuni opportunistically eating on GSOB. So I've never seen any of the parasitoids. Nothing's ever pop popped out of the wood that I have. So not really looking good for a natural enemy complex, which is another reason I do think it was introduced into California. If a range expansion, you'd expect to see the parasitoids come along with it. So is GSOB really from Arizona? It's what the taxonomists think. These are all the previous collection records. Now what's nice about these areas, if you know anything about southeastern Arizona, they call these sky islands. So it's desert below, you start going up in elevation, you get your forest. So very distinct mountain ranges. So what we're doing, and this is the work we're doing with Stout Hammer, is really trying to identify is this, did our population come here? Can we say, oh, it, it came potentially from the Chiricahuas? And see if we can link that with our California populations. <coughs> Or is it from Mexico? The taxonomist said I was wasting my time potentially going to Mexico, but we'll see if they're right. So we did get funding this year to go down to Chiapas to look at some of these previous areas to figure out, see if we can find GSOB populations, natural enemies, any of the host data. It's never been noted as any kind of problem or associated with tree injury in these areas. So we'll be working from scratch again, and then maybe in 2011, we'll go up to northern Mexico and see if we can find some of these other areas where silverleaf and emery oak stretch into. So instead of GSOB, we're going to be looking for GSOB, but we're going to be looking for a little bit more of, excuse me for my Spanish, el oro mancado roble perforar. That's GSOB translated, and I never took Spanish. So that's what we'll be looking for, and hopefully we'll find it. And we can get these populations to test the genetics with. <coughs> So back to firewood movement. <clears throat> this is from Southern California. This is on private land. This in the background is National Forest. This is another all oak firewood. If that's not scary enough, how about this? This is on Interstate 8. You can see we were driving. I wasn't driving, but this is Coast Live Oak. So wood is moving from these areas, and it they can support populations. I get tons of beetles out of firewood. So what is the threat to California? This is the stand distribution for Coast Live Oak. So here it is, of course, Southern California and runs up all the way in the northern parts of California. How about California Black Oak? Again, up the Sierras, in the Oregon, and down along the coast. So again, kind of hammering home that this beetle can withstand some cold weather. This is just your plant hardiness zone map. Uh, average minimal temperature. So GSOB is already in this kind of brown and green, same over here in southeastern Arizona. You can see this does stretch all the way up into Oregon. So I do believe this is not just going to be a Southern California problem. It will move further north. 
So what are we doing for GSOB 2010? This should look familiar. Basically about everything we're doing now. We're going to continue this in some form or fashion, but we are adding these Mexican oak surveys, and we are adding a risk assessment. So how cold temperatures can it withstand? What are its other susceptible hosts, and what is its dispersal? And we're working with Rob Bennett on that uh, to tease that out this year, and it'll probably be a two or three year project. So as far as 2010, well, they got me carrying firewood again. So this is what we've already started collecting, infested woods from dead cut trees to get populations. Everybody needs populations this year, and this has already begun. So with that, I certainly have to thank my two techs. They've basically worked on every aspect of this. Within the Forest Service, my own unit, FHP, and our Forest Health Monitoring Group out of California, PSWs contribute a lot. Also, my FHP counterparts in Arizona. The Cleveland and the Coronado have been very helpful on letting me do my work. CAL FIRE has helped with the survey trapping throughout the state. UC Davis, a couple of postdocs have contributed this work. Of course, from Riverside, Mark's taking the biocontrol piece. Richard is helping us tease out the genetics, where our population came from. And of course, our funding agencies. The Forest Service has really put in a lot of money into this in every aspect of really kind of detection down to the impact, um, <clears throat> the risk assessment, the survey work, also the biocontrol, and then our travel to Mexico and every other little piece. So with that, I'll take questions. Tom, do you have any idea what the uh, Paris Commune rates are? <coughs> For the Upelman, I have a, a guess. So as I was chipping away the bark, I could see the ectoparasitoid. So from what I encountered, about 12 or 13 percent, which is, from what they know with bronze birch borer, it's about 18 percent. So not too bad. For the Braconid, I don't know because I never found it. Um, it just emerged out of my infested pieces of bark. but. Uh, it, I, I feel comfortable with 12, 13 percent. It's not, we don't see it every time we cut in the trees. When Mark and I were last out there, you know, we ran across it a few times, but it, it wasn't every time we ran and found a larva. Have you been able to use the oak distributions in Arizona, both in terms of elevation and also northern distribution, to predict something like the northern? So we have. Um, from our forest inventory analysis data, which is where we got those Coast Live California black oak maps. Silverleaf and emery oak, they really don't go that much further in Arizona. What you really see expand up is gamble oak, a white oak. And I'd, I've never seen it in gamble oak. Um, it has more of a southern distribution. They, they f overflow a little bit into New Mexico, but mostly go to the south. And they really, I think even once you kind of get out of the Tucson area, they get real spotty. Um, but I'd, I'd, that's the thing, we've never had any collection records, not to say it isn't there. If we get more time, I'd like to see go to some of those areas. But even with what I've tried to get our forest health people in Arizona to do is map mortality. Help us key in on some of this. And they just never have. They've never been concerned about hardwood mortality in general. I mean, we're typically all timber beasts, but I'm trying to change them and say, if you see an oak die, just help us. Put a dot on a map for us. And I think they've started to do that, but the, the red oak gets pretty limited once you start moving a little bit, even in central Arizona. And it certainly doesn't get its, I don't think, much further north than Phoenix, kind of that longitude across. Um, what I'm curious about is Mexico. I mean, it's not going to be easy to map species distribu distributions there, but hopefully if we find something, I can get an idea maybe also get another idea of susceptibility. I mean, what really throws me is canyon live oak, um, just because it's this intermediate oak species. I would be surprised if any of the white oaks get attacked and succumb, but that's really what we're gonna test this year is the rest of the native California oak species. What I would like to see are the ones you have outside the door here, or holly oak, cork oak, a lot of these urban landscape plantings to see if they are susceptible.